Hello everyone, and welcome to the 165th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring the villainous characters of John Wick Chapter 1. There's been a lot of requests over the years for me to cover many of the numerous baddies we're presented with in this franchise, and considering how phenomenal this series is, that's no surprise. But though there are some characters that appear in later films that I've seen requested more than the ones I'm covering in this video, I figured it'd be best if I started out with the ones we find in the first film, instead of jumping ahead. I've chosen to cover most of the villainous characters of note that you can find in the first film. However, I haven't included any characters that appear in subsequent films, or other entries in this series, as if they are in further entries, it's likely that they need an entire video dedicated solely to their characters. So with that in mind, in this video we're going to be discussing the evil surrounding Vigo Tarasov, his son Yosef, and one Miss Perkins, the only assassin of note who manages to get close to fulfilling the contract that Vigo places on John. Now let's start off by discussing the man who set the events of this story in motion, Yosef Tarasov. Now without further ado, let's begin. Yosef is a classic case of what type of person someone develops into when they're raised by a wealthy criminal. Being raised in a world of privilege, violence, and crime, Yosef, as the presumptive heir to a vast criminal organization, has been spoiled to high heaven and been allowed to let his darker tendencies flourish in preparation for his ascension to his father's throne. And due to these influences, Yosef has become a crass, lecherous, pompous, arrogant, petulant, and cruel man. But most of all, he's dangerously cocky and stupid. In our first encounter with Yosef, he comes off friendly enough, commenting on the beauty of John's 69 Mustang and inquiring whether or not he might be able to purchase it in a respectful manner. However, once the spoiled and pompous Yosef is denied something he wants, he resorts to throwing what he thought to be a covert insult at John, then he nearly flies off the handle once John returns that insult back to him before one of his goons stops him. Behavior that he displays again when he's denied his baby's bottle of champagne at the Red Circle. So we know this isn't just a one-off thing for Yosef, which makes sense, as this is the type of behavior that you'd expect from a man like Yosef. Now, if the exchange he had with John had been between any two average citizens, then perhaps this would have been the end of the matter, as it's not often that two people have a dispute in public, and then one of them chooses to hunt the other down to cause them further pain. But for a brat like Yosef, such an insult isn't one that he can bear without attempting to prove his superiority over the person who insulted him, let alone someone who denied him something that he wanted, which I'm sure is something that he isn't used to. So here, Yosef does the only thing he knows how to do. He pursues John and enacts violence upon a man who he feels has wronged him, because it's what a man like Yosef does. Now his father, Vigo Tarasov, is altogether a different man from his son, though he does share a few similarities with his son that we'll touch on a bit later. He's brutal and cruel like any gangster typically is, but he also displays a level of amiability and relatability that softens his character and gives us the impression that he's more than a violent criminal who's out to make a quick buck and destroy his enemies. He's smartly dressed, clean cut, calm, collected, and as debonair as you might expect a mobster of his status and station to be, and Vigo is a man who's clearly made it to where he is now by starting from the bottom and working his way up the ladder. And one thing in particular that points to this notion, and sets Vigo apart from many villains like him, is the level of practical intelligence he displays when he's forced to deal with John Wick. When Vigo learns what his son has done from Aurelio, Vigo immediately understands the gravity of the situation. His face is emotionless and contemplative, the immense danger he's just been forced into weighing heavy on his mind as it races to find a solution to a problem that is now more imperative to solve than any other business venture he's currently faced with. As Vigo, unlike his son, is likely a self-made man who's lived a life filled with violent struggles and hardship. And he knows that underestimating your foes, especially a foe like John Wick, is a one-way ticket to seeing everything you hold dear destroyed before your life is taken away. Yes, he's angry with his son, and he offers him a swift and brutal punishment for his transgression. But when it comes to dealing with John Wick, he doesn't panic, nor does he enter into a state of rage and concoct a haphazard and insufficient plan to deal with this walking death machine. Instead, he steals himself and approaches the situation calmly and rationally, as Vigo knew the moment that he was made aware that John is hunting him, that he had only two options. Throw everything he has at him in an attempt to stop him, or hide himself and those he values away, so he might bide his time and surmount the impossible odds stacked against him, which included placing an enormous $2 million bounty on John's head, one that he promised to double if anyone was foolish enough to break the rules of neutrality that serve as the supreme law on the grounds of any continental establishment. As far as planning for this situation is concerned, this is about as smart as it gets, as when you're dealing with a man that can kill three men with a pencil, every resource available to you should be employed to put a stop to his hunt for you. And placing the bounty on John also improves your chances of someone like Miss Perkins handling the problem for you without having to suffer too many losses in your own organization. Now, though Miss Perkins isn't given too much screen time, she does represent an archetype of criminal that even fellow criminals loathe, the type that will do any job no matter what it is or who it's targeting, so long as they're paid enough a criminal who doesn't adhere to any sort of code aside from getting paid in any way they can. Perkins knows John as a professional acquaintance, and possibly as a friend, but whatever relationship she may have had with him is immediately thrown to the wayside as soon as his face turns into a big fat dollar sign in her head. 
Like Yosef, Perkins also suffers from an overinflated ego, and she's similarly reckless when you consider she was willing to kill John Wick on Continental grounds, and even more so when you factor in that she probably would have gotten off with a lighter punishment from Continental management had she not killed Harry, a case of the big bad assassin only looking out for herself who overestimated her abilities and paid the ultimate price for it. A foil to Perkins would be Marcus, who, while being an assassin whose profession marks him as a man who dabbles in evil acts for the sake of enriching himself, is not a man who would forsake his code of honor or the bonds he's made with his fellow assassins, a man who won't betray his friends for his own benefit, even if he leads a questionable lifestyle himself. Now let's get back to Vigo and the scenario this film presents us with. One thing that's important to note about Vigo is that this entire situation is indirectly his fault due to his own shortcomings. His parenting style is one of them, as though the nature of Vigo and Yosef's father-son relationship and Yosef's overall character are enough to show us that he wasn't raised in the best way. We're given a blatant example of how Yosef developed into such an arrogant and foolhardy criminal under his father's tutelage. When Vigo remarks that he isn't necessarily mad at Yosef for stealing a car and killing a dog, he's mad at him because he didn't think beyond his baser instincts before he did so, and ended up doing it to the wrong person, which shows you how wonderful of a father Vigo Tarasov must have been. And that brings us to Vigo's second mistake as far as his son in this situation is concerned, never introducing Yosef to John Wick. From what little conversation we're given between father and son, we can deduce that Yosef is a somewhat integral part of the Tarasov organization, as his father trusts him enough to carry out jobs and command his own crew. However, it would seem that Vigo keeps certain aspects of his business affairs and associates private, which I'm sure is a smart move in a sense, as Yosef is the kind of person who seems liable to endanger any deal or relationship he's exposed to with his recklessness. But you'd think that Vigo would have at least made his son aware of the most dangerous person associated with their operation, lest he potentially cross paths with him. As if they don't all live in the same city, they do live in the same general area and maintain similar relationships with other people. So the likelihood of Yosef stumbling upon John at some point was higher than average. And for these reasons, Vigo only has himself to blame for Yosef's behavior and the ensuing turmoil his family faced. Now on some level, Vigo is aware that his current predicament is his fault, as during his would-be final conversation with John Wick, he remarks that the life he and John live is a curse, and that curse is liable to ruin everything that the afflicted touches. But curse isn't really the right word, is it? There is no ethereal force plaguing the life of Vigo Tarasov. It's his own wretched choices that have placed him in the position he's in, and it's those choices that end up sealing his son's fate, and his own. However, both Vigo and his son had opportunities to save themselves from all this trouble. Of course, Yosef could have chosen not to steal John Wick's car and kill his dog, but then we wouldn't have a film, so there's not much merit in pointing that out. What we can point to, though, is what Yosef could control once he had committed this deed, and when examining his robbery of John Wick, we find that Yosef made one crucial mistake here that could have saved his life, not killing John Wick. As Yosef, more than anyone else who tried to kill John after the fact in this film, had the greatest opportunity to do so when he and his crew broke into his home. At this moment in time, John was caught unawares and unarmed, and Yosef and his goons had him reeling on the floor after they had just given him a brutal beating, giving them ample opportunity to just execute John here and be done with this whole affair. To be fair though, Yosef wasn't aware that John was this legendary killing machine, so in his mind, he likely felt secure in exacting his revenge on some loser who dared to defy him that he'd then never see again. So it makes sense why Yosef wouldn't take on the added risk of killing a man and having that trace back to him. Vigo, however, has no excuse for not killing John when he had his chance to. After John destroys Vigo's stash and has a shootout with him and his henchmen, John is lying on the ground just as vulnerable as he was when Yosef had beaten him during the robbery. All it would have taken in this moment was a bullet to the head and his troubles would have been over. But here's where those similarities that Vigo shares with his son come into play. Arrogance and ego compels Vigo to have the last laugh, so to speak, before he ends John's life. And so he takes John to an undisclosed location where he can teach him a lesson before he does what he needs to do. This was wholly unnecessary, and had pride not entered into the equation the moment Vigo had rendered John defenseless, both he and his son would have lived to tell the tale. Now his son was already dead at this point, so there was no way of healing that wound, but Vigo goes on to commit another blunder when he decides to torture and kill Marcus after he learns that he not only didn't kill John Wick when he could have, but assisted him in evading Vigo's other forces that were looking to end his life. Once again, pride and ego stand front and center, as Vigo, the ruthless mob boss, couldn't bear to let such an insult go unpunished. Had Vigo simply cut his losses at this point and let Marcus live, he would have likely never encountered John ever again, and he could have lived out the rest of his life being the general blight on society that he is. But no, he couldn't resist sticking it to both Marcus and John one last time, and his arrogance in assuming that this would be the one thing he could get away with ensured that Vigo's minutes were numbered. So with all these things in mind, it's comical when Vigo remarks when he's torturing Marcus that if he had done his job and executed John Wick when he had the chance, that his son would still be alive. As if Vigo had not only made better life choices, but made sounder decisions when rearing his son, 
running his criminal organization, and during this whole affair in general, none of the events of this story would have even occurred in the first place. To his credit, though, at least when he was finally forced to face John, he faced him with some honor and dignity, a man who fought the impossible till the very end. So at the end of this story, when all is said and done, what is there to say about Vigo, his son, and Miss Perkins? Well, all of them were violent career criminals who met a violent end due to their choices in life. And as with any story involving criminals getting their due, one of the primary lessons here is that being a criminal isn't really worth an untimely death, no matter how glamorous the prospect of becoming one might seem. As far as Perkins is concerned, she's fairly easy to evaluate based on what we're given. She's a selfish woman with a massive ego who made egotistical and selfish choices that doomed her as those choices often do. We don't know whether or not Yosef chose to follow in his father's footsteps of his own volition, or if he was conditioned to become the man he was by his father. But if that was the case, then Yosef was sort of doomed to follow this path. And while he was essentially a criminal rich kid with an attitude to match, who a child develops into is largely due to how they're raised, and we can sympathize with a man who was nurtured in part by evil elements. However, that doesn't excuse Yosef's actions. And while he perhaps didn't deserve to die for beating a man, stealing a car, and killing his dog, I'm sure he deserved it in some way for the many other horrid things he had accomplished over the course of his short life. The same could be said for his father. However, there's something we have to consider here when examining what Vigo did in this scenario specifically. While Vigo's lifestyle and choices ultimately led him to the point where he had to enter into a life or death struggle with John Wick, everything Vigo does in this film before he kills Marcus could actually be considered self-defense. Make no mistake, though he has some redeeming qualities, Vigo Tarasov was not a good person, and I'm sure he deserved to be punished for numerous things just like his son did. But whether or not John was justified in murdering his son for what he did is debatable, a debate we'll have to discuss in another video. However, once Vigo killed Marcus, it's hard to fault John for seeking revenge against him. Revenge isn't a good thing, and it often leads to worse things occurring down the line once you've exacted your revenge. But at least we can safely say Vigo earned the punishment John gave him. When it comes down to it, what we're presented with in this film is the story of a group of people engaged in evil acts both past and present that are caught in a whirlwind of violence, death, and misery due to their own choices and decision-making. And well, if you reap what you sow, and if you're reaping evil, then you'll often find that evil will assure your undoing. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Vigo, Yosef, and Miss Perkins? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.